Right, so hi everybody, welcome to a the AFMS seminar for this week. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Mingzi Zhang, who is in the Faculty of Engineering at the University of New South Wales. Dr. Zhang obtained his PhD from Tohoku University in Japan in 2017. His area ex of expertise includes image-based simulation of vascular diseases, as well as simulation and patient-specific planning of their endovascular treatments. And he's going to be talking about some of his work on fluid simulation uh, today. So please go ahead. And begin. Thank you, Kat, for your kind introduction. Let me share my screen. Yes, Can everybody see my screen now? Uh, yes, that's clear. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mingzi, and I'm currently with Susan's group, also called Sydney Vascular Modeling Group, um, within the University of New South Wales. And it's my great pleasure to talk to you today about my research, uh, which is on the topic of application of biofluid dynamics uh, to the study of vascular diseases and the treatments. Um, so, beginning with a short introduction of myself. Uh, I obtained a Master of Research in Biomechanics from Beijing University of Technology in China back in 2013. And after I obtained my master's degree, I moved to Japan uh, to go for a PhD in engineering at Tohoku University um, in Professor Makoto Ota's laboratory. And uh, during my PhD study, I met uh, with my, my supervisor at Macquarie University in a conference uh, Professor Yi Chen, and he introduced me that uh, I can be jointly enrolled at Macquarie University to, to go for a second PhD. Then um, I have since been enrolled jointly at Tohoku and Macquarie, and I obtained my second PhD in biomedical uh, sciences from Macquarie University um, back in 2018. And before I start to work with Dr. Susan Beyer at UNSW, uh, I had postdoc experience back in Japan for two years as the biofluid dynamics lab and one year uh, postdoc experience with Professor Yi Chen's group at Faculty of Medicine, Health and Human Sciences at Macquarie University. So um, the outline of my uh, talk today um, uh, consists of three parts. I'll be talking about um, the biofluid application on uh, this is uh, on to assist the disease diagnosis and risk, stratifi risk stratification. And the second part is to uh, use fluid dynamics uh, to, to estimate the in vivo human dynamic parameters. And the last part is to use um, CFD uh, to help with surgical and interventional treatments individualization. So um, the first application is on uh, intracranial aneurysms. Um, a short introduction of intracranial aneurysm. Uh, this is a disease with a very high prevalence. Uh, almost 10% of the entire population may have brain aneurysms. So you may have aneurysm, but you don't know it. Brain aneurysm can be a, a serious disease if it ruptures. Um, the 30 days mortality rate can be as high as 30%. 30 and the brain aneurysm is due to the weakening and damage of the vascular wall. As you can see in this picture, it's like a balloon, a bulge uh, attached to the artery. Uh, blood can go into the aneurysm, causing the aneurysm to rupture. Um, although this, this disease has a high prevalence rate, but only 10% uh, of the patients with cerebral aneurysm will experience aneurysm rupture. So it is very important to, to screen out those patients uh, who has a higher risk to, to, whose aneurysm has a higher risk to rapture. Um, so the aim, of study, uh, the aim of this study was to use uh, safety, to use fluid dynamics, to seek for uh, hemodynamic identifiers of brain aneurysm that has a higher risk of rapture. And we hope to establish a model uh, to predict the risk, to stratify the risk of aneurysm rapture based upon uh, simulations. Um, actually, a lot of parameters have been proposed uh, 
by 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 many other groups in the past 20 to 30 years, they proposed the uh, the intraaneurysm of flow rates uh, to 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 examine the flow patterns within the aneurysm to see whether there's uh, any jet flow impeaching pitching against the vascular wall to cause the aneurysm to rupture. Uh, the pressure distribution on the vascular wall or the pressure drop across the aneurysm and some other surface-based parameter like aneurysm wash stress or salutary shear index, uh, which quantifies the change of the wash stress over the cardiac cycle, a lot of parameters. But uh, there are some limitations. The first limitation is it is very hard uh, to obtain the physiologically real boundary conditions because a reliable safety simulation of aneurysm depends heavily upon uh, a reasonable assumption of the boundary conditions. But uh, uh, patients' um, velocity, blood velocity and pressure uh, varies from, from one to another. And uh, to measure the pressure, the gold standard is to use a catheter, which is invasive. It's not possible to measure the pressure for, for every patient. And for velocity, although it can be um, achieved by using transcranial uh, Doppler ultrasound. Um, studies reported that there's a, uh, a great in interrate variability. So the, the real how to set the boundary condition is a, is a, is a big hurdle. And the second one is um, the aneurysm surface-based parameters uh, depends on strongly on the quality of the segmentation. Uh, different um, we, we may collect CTA images, the brain CTA images to segments aneurysm, but different people, different operator may result in different results. Uh, if the aneurysm is over smoothed or under smoothed, we may have totally different uh, aneurysm wash stress or OSI. And the third limitation is about the data sets based on which uh, previous, group, previous groups have been um, uh, doing their research. Uh, for stable aneurysm, uh, let's say if we have a patient presenting in the clinic today and the aneurysm, the aneurysm is not raptured, if we classify this patient as, uh, into, the, in, into the stable group, we don't know whether the aneurysm will rapture tomorrow or the day after. So um, to define uh, the stable as stable aneurysm, we need to have a relatively longer period of follow, follow up time to make sure that the aneurysm defined as stable uh, are genuinely stable. And for aneurysm uh, classified as raptured aneurysm, uh, also have uh, we also have problem with it because when patient present uh, symptoms, um, received a 3D RI of CTA examinations, the aneurysm has already raptured. The morphology will change dramatically after uh, the rapture of aneurysm. Um, many studies they use the image of uh, enraptured aneurysm to do CFD simulation, but uh, um, the hemodynamic characteristics corresponding to the raptured aneurysm uh, should not be used to predict whether the aneurysm will will rapture or not. So to resolve this problem, we defined a novel uh, hemodynamic parameter called intraaneurysmal energy loss uh, that quantifies the change in the pressure and the kinetic energy in a vascular system with and without the aneurysm. To obtain this parameter, uh, we first segment uh, the aneurysm with the parent, parent artery out uh, based on uh, the patient's CTA or 3D RA image. And then we remove the artery. Uh, this process can be done manually or can be done automatically uh, by use of uh, open library VMTK vascular modeling toolkit to have the vascular uh, structure without aneurysm. And we calculate the energy difference between the inlets and outlets using the equation. So we can have the energy difference with aneurysm and without aneurysm. And then we can have the energy loss uh, by, by calculating the difference between the two values divided by um, the volume of the aneurysm. By doing so, we, have, we don't have to uh, look at the local aneurysm parameters on, on the vascular wall and water stress or OSI. So we, we, just, we just quantify pressure and, and kinetic energy change um, as a whole. So uh, by doing so, 
uh, this parameter is less sensitive to the medical imager quality and to the segmentation protocol or to uh, less sensitive to who performed the, the segmentation. And then to, um, to construct the aneurysm database, um, this is an NHMC project. Uh, we, we, we established a multi-center uh, international uh, database based on um, aneurysms collected from uh, three different countries. We are in collaboration with Monash Medical Center and Macquarie Medical Imaging and Waseda University back in Japan and Zhujiang University in China. We're collecting aneurysms uh, from different international centers. And we included aneurysm um, with more than one longitudinal follow-up. That means uh, we have patient images at baseline when they present symptom or when uh, it is identified in a, in a physical examination. We, we collect more than one, um, one uh, we will collect images at baseline and different follow-ups for, for some patient. We, we, we have more than uh, two follow-up images to make sure that um, the aneurysm we have included into our database as unraptured aneurysm or stable aneurysm are generally stable aneurysm. And for uh, those raptured aneurysm uh, classified as rapture in our database, uh, only uh, the CT images prior to rapture uh, were reconstructed uh, for, for the study of aneurysm hemodynamics to make sure um, the, the results are meaningful. And we also uh, collect the complete image data and patient history uh, of, of the patients enrolled in this study, finally resulting in uh, a total of 186 aneurysm um, um, of, of this aneurysm 55 uh, are raptured aneurysm. Um, the next step is to make hemodynamic parameters independent of perinatal flow, uh, because as uh, introduced before, the perinatal uh, the boundary condition setting up will have a huge diff uh, will have a huge impact on on, on the hemodynamic simulation results. So we, we want to make the parameters uh, make make our calculations uh, independent of perinatal flow. To do so, uh, we characterize the a parameter of interest. It could be energy loss. It could be wash stress or intraenerosinal flow. Uh, we 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 characterizing the parameter of interest with respect to the change in perinatal flow um, at four conditions uh, from 0.1 millimeter per, uh, meters per second to 0.4 meters per second. And this range covered the possible range of the internal carotid artery um, blood flow velocity of normal patients. So by doing so, uh, we're not quantifying the absolute hemodynamic parameters. We're quantifying the response of those parameters to the change in the perinatal flow. Um, so uh, these parameters are made independent of perinatal flow. So we don't have to, um, to, 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 to justify the, the boundary condition prior to uh, the CFD simulations. And uh, we tested uh, two parameters, uh, wash stress and energy loss. Uh, their conventional form in physical units and their flow rate independent form uh, after, um, after correlating with the parent artery on three different classification models, a logistic regression and a add boost and a support, uh, support vec vector machine um, to see whether these parameters have prognosed um, uh, is of prognosed performance in predicting whether the aneurysm is stable or not. So to set up uh, the training cohort, uh, we, we combined the aneurysm cases collected from three centers uh, to be the training and validation group. And we set aside uh, the aneurysm collected from a, a fourth center as an external test uh, data set to make sure the models we established are of, um, are of good generalizability. And this slide shows um, the results of our analysis. Um, for the conventional parameter in physical units and for flow rate independent parameter, um, 
we, we can we can see that uh, the flow rate independent parameter is better uh, than the conventional parameter in predicting whether the aneurysm uh, is stable or not. And we find that energy loss uh, has a better prognostic performance uh, than that of the wall shear stress and the maximal uh, sensitivity and specificity corresponding to the yoda, to the best yoda index uh, were both above 0.8. It's uh, uh, quite high sensitivity and specificity, which have um, a potential to be used in uh, future clinical application. And this and this result has been submitted to a prestigious journal in our field, neural interventional surgery. This journal does not always. Uh, accept CFD study, but uh, it recently got accepted. So um, a summary of this study, we have put uh, forward a novel hemodynamic discriminator called intraaneurysmal energy loss. And this parameter quantified the changes in the pressure and kinetic energy uh, caused by the presence of aneurysm. And uh, this parameter is less sensitive uh, to, to the vascular geometry, and it has a greater integrated reliability if we use this um, parameter to, uh, to predict uh, the aneurysm stability. And we, we have established a novel strategy to make parameters uh, independent of the inflow so that quantifying response of the, the parameter of interest to the perineal artery inflow will resolve the difficulties in obtaining um, uh, in vivo flow boundary condition um, boundary conditions, and we have constructed a reliable machine learning model uh, to predict aneurysm rapture. Um, this this model was uh, trained and tested on multi-center uh, international aneurysm data sets with external uh, test set to scrutinize the model generalizability. So um, that is the first application uh, I, I introduced, uh, which is regarding the use of fluid dynamics um, to, to, to help um, clinical practice, to help doctors in stratify the risk of, uh, risk of disease. And the second application is to use CFD uh, to measure um, those hemodynamic parameters that otherwise have to be measured by invasive procedure. So uh, this, this study is on the coctation of aorta. Uh, as you can see, this is the coctation and this is the descending aorta, which is a, a very important artery supplying the blood uh, to, the, to the, lower, the lower part of the of body. Um, COA is the sudden narrowing of the descending aorta. And it could be congenital, or it could be um, caused by trauma. And according to American Heart Association and European Society of, Ecology, uh, of Cardiologists guideline, uh, if a peak-to-peak -peak pressure drop across the coctation uh, is greater than 20 millimeter uh, per rate, then it is an indication for a clinical intervention or patients will develop heart failure or hypertension or other uh, related complications. But the gold standard uh, to measure the pressure drop across a coctation uh, was by uh, is by diagnostic cast cardiac casterization, which, which is to uh, advance a pressure sensor through the femoral artery uh, to probe the pressure proximal and distal um, to the to the stenosis. This is an invasive procedure. A patient needs to be put into general anesthesia. Uh, it's risky. Um, of uh, inflammation and infection, and it's also costly. Um, the, the pressure sensor could be up to $1,000. So uh, the aim of our study is to replace um, the invasive measurements that needs um, an anesthesia and needs caster to, but with non-invasive uh, measurement of the pressure uh, drop. Um, our um, our uh, proposed method was to use um, uh, medical imaging method 
uh, for example, use CT to get the morphology, to get the geometry of the patient's descending aorta uh, with the coctation, and to use uh, ultrasonography to detect uh, the, the in vivo velocity to be uh, specified as boundary condition uh, for the CFD simulations to measure, to calculate the pressure drop, uh, across the pressure uh, across the COA. So what we did is we collected uh, 40 patients with type one or type two COA. We excluded COA, type three COA because um, that type of COA has collateral arteries. Um, the morphology is, is, is more complex. And those 40 patients, they had undergone, undergone uh, Doppler echocardiography to um, to get the maximal velocity at the COA portion, as well as, as aortic CTA to get the, the geometry of, uh, of, of the aorta and with the computation, as you can see here, 40 patients uh, reconstructed COA image. And those patients uh, had also undergone um, a cardiac casterization because we want to test whether uh, our proposed non-invasive method is of good diagnostic performance, we need to uh, have the gold standard uh, measurement method performed, which is through cardiac casterization. And uh, when collecting the data sets, we set a period of time between any of the three, uh, any two of the three examinations uh, being less than one month, because uh, most of the patients we, um, we have enrolled are our children, our baby, uh, one month, uh, the, the, they all have, may, may experience a, uh, a big change in its morphology. And we do uh, image segmentation. We segment the Alta model uh, by 3D slicer, which is an open, uh, open source library. And uh, the, the, the aortic model of each patient was reviewed by two cardiologists to make sure uh, the models we reconstructed reflect uh, um, the structure of the patient's aortic artery, uh, patient descending aorta uh, in vivo. So to set up a CFD simulation to, uh, to estimate the pressure gradient, uh, we proposed a TVA strategy, which is to target value approaching strategy. Um, what we have is uh, the maximal velocity measured by a Doppler, Doppler echocardiography at this portion. And we use a transient uh, simulation strategy to carry it out, uh, to carry out a, stat, a steady state simulation. And during the simulation, uh, we, uh, we make the maximal velocity uh, in the simulation to progress towards that uh, measured by the, the Doppler echocardiography. Echo uh, by slightly uh, alter the, the, D, um, the, the velocity at the DIO, the descending alta, uh, following this equation um, to, to make the velocity here approach to uh, the velocity measured in vivo. So uh, this is a strategy we put forward to quantify the pressure drop. And uh, as reference, we also set up a simple steady state flow simulation um, by using uh, the velocity here uh, as the outlet condition uh, of the DIO. And we also compared um, the simulation result against uh, the Doppler uh, echocardiography, uh, which also, they, they also report the pressure drop based on uh, the simpli simplified Bernoulli equation. So um, we, we compared the results of our target value approaching methods and our target value fixing methods, um, Doppler and Cuff BP gauge against uh, the gold standard casterization. Um, in this slide, you can see that um, the TVA strategy we proposed has the highest, has the greatest correlation uh, with uh, in vivo measurements by cardiac casterization. And the agreements between the TVA strategy and cardiac casterization 
um, it is the best among the four strategies we have investigated. Um, Doppler um, pressure drop estimated by Doppler uh, may overestimate uh, the pressure by eight and using um, the, a, a blood pressure gauge may underestimate the pressure by uh, more than 10 millimeter mil correct. So uh, by doing this study, we have in integrated clinical measurements uh, in, in this case, uh, the Doppler echocardiography into CFD simulations. We're not assuming any boundary conditions. We're using uh, the boundary conditions measured in vivo. And um, the strategy TVA, the TV, TVA strategy we, um, we proposed have achieved um, um, non-invasive estimation of pressure drop across uh, a COA. And the result is comparable to the invasive pressure measurement by casterization. And the sensitivity and specificity in distinguishing uh, the pressure drop across COA in greater than 20 millimeter mercury reached 0.92 and 0.93, uh, which is um, which is good. This is the, our, our, uh, the receiver operating uh, characteristic curves. As you can see, TVA uh, has a very good uh, IUC compared to TVF and Doppler. And the third application is uh, to use fluid uh, dynamic simulation to, to, to individualize uh, surgical or, uh, or interventional surgery. So this application is about the flow diversion treatment of intracranial aneurysm, brain aneurysm, as introduced before. This is an aneurysm. Uh, to treat the aneurysm, uh, a flow diverter can be placed in the perineal artery. Flow diverter is a highly dense mesh tubular uh, uh, a tube, uh, which um, by placing the flow diverting stent into the perineal artery, uh, it can reconstruct the perineal artery and rehabilit rehabilitate local hemodynamics by redirecting much of the flow that would otherwise go into the aneurysm to remain in the perineal artery to promote uh, blood clotting inside the aneurysm. And finally, the aneurysm thrombotic occlusion then is treated flow diversion treatment. But uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, flow diverting stands um, commercially available on the market. Uh, the different brands, they have different uh, filament structure, they have different diameter. And um, um, sometimes in, in the treatments, one flow diverting stand is not enough. The flow division efficacy is not uh, sufficient. Sometimes a second or third flow diverting stand uh, is needed. And uh, a push and pull strategy was um, we, we, we are practiced by a neuro interventionists to, gener uh, to, to generate a locally denser um, uh, mesh area to prevent more blood from going into the aneurysm. Uh, a lot of treatment modes and treatment strategies uh, are available, but um, pay, uh, but the uh, but neuro interventionists. Uh, treat a patient based on their own experience, based on their individual experience and their own predilections. Uh, they don't know um, um, the choice of the stand, uh, the number of stands, or whether compaction technique or not. Um, the, the exact effects on, on the flow division performance. So uh, the aim of this study uh, was to develop a virtual stand deployment method that can be used to rehearse a, a prospective treatment plan or a series of uh, prospective treatment plans. And we can examine uh, the treatment outcomes uh, by CFD simulation. Uh, we, can tell the, we can tell the treating clinicians uh, following which plan, how much better the, 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 the flow diversion can be achieved and what are the flow patterns corresponding to each plan. Uh, that is to individualize the treatment plan to select the optimal treatment plan for, 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 for the patient towards uh, precision medicine. Uh, 
And to do this, we developed a virtual stand deployment uh, method. Um, this, is, this was surely achieved through uh, the use of FEA. Um, people have to generate mesh for the stand and the rest collector, um, which is not suitable to be used in um, medical practice because it, it consumes, consumes too much time. So what we did is uh, we used a spring mesh model uh, to represent the structure of the flow diverting stand. And it was assumed that the flow diverting stem struct um, at the cent at center line without without thickness, and the intersection of those um, um, of those center lines are considered a mass point, and the mass points are connected with their uh, neighboring mass point by springs, and the stiffness of the springs can represent the length and thickness of the flow diverting stem wires. Um, by this assumption, we can use uh, the three-dimensional Hooke's law um, to, to model the, the, the flow diverting, uh, the, the stand deployment procedure from the initial condition to the unloaded condition uh, controlled by uh, a boundary detection algorithm um, to prevent the, the, the stand from penetrating uh, the vascular wall to, to go to outside of the, the, the vascular chart. And uh, uh, we did a validation of, um, of our virtual stand deployment methods. Uh, in this column, you, you, you can see that we uh, deployed a real silk stand into a silicon aneurysm model. And in this column, uh, this is the stand we visually deployed using the spring mass strategy. And uh, um, we, we measured uh, the top three, uh, three most important uh, stand parameters called porosity, uh, pore density, and breeding angle um, in this area of interest. And we compared uh, the parameter differences in these parameters between in vitro and virtual deployment. And the statistical analysis told out there is uh, no statistically significant difference between um, the vascular, uh, between the stand morphology uh, deployed uh, using our algorithm against the virtual deployment. So um, after validation of the algorithm, we developed, uh, we investigated um, uh, stand deployment with the compaction technique uh, applied. <coughs> we quantified um, the compaction ratio uh, by three parameters, which is the non-compacted condition uh, equivalent to uh, the stand. Uh, you, you put a stand on table without any load and uh, the maximum compact, uh, com compacted condition and the neck width, uh, we can quantify the maximal uh, compaction length. And we investigated four compaction ratios, non-compaction 25, 15, 70 compaction ratio to see um, their effects on flow diversion performance. And we tested um, uh, stand compaction on two aneurysms. Um, we deployed a stand of three different sizes, uh, four, 4.5, 5-millimeter, uh, with four different compaction ratios, non-compaction and maximal compaction, compaction, to a successfully treated case and to an unsuccessful fully treated case. And we examined the, the metal cavity ratio uh, corresponding to each treatment uh, scenario. Um, the, the nominal metal coverage ratio of the stand is 30%. And for the successfully treated case under the non-compaction uh, condition, we can see uh, it achieved 29% of the NCR, but for the untreated but for the unsuccessful case, only 25. Uh, when we compact the stand to the maximum length uh, for the successful case, 60%, uh, unsuccessful case, 50%, there's 10% difference between the metal coverage ratio. A closer look uh, into uh, the, the wire structure across the aneurysm, Austin, 
we found that the parent artery morphology would affect uh, the post-standing uh, metal coverage ratio, especially when the aneurysm uh, is located uh, in a location where it is uh, a great variation in the, in the parent artery curvature. Then um, the, the wires might be pushed further into the aneurysm, causing a lower metal coverage ratio uh, achieved. So um, examination of wire structure suggests that uh, applying the same compaction technique in different patients uh, may not result in the same metal coverage ratio. And corresponding to uh, each treatment scenario, we generate a mesh, we do the CFD simulation, we quantify the intra-aneurysmal average velocity, energy loss, and mass flow rate uh, to, to see how much improvement um, in the flow division efficacy can be achieved by compacting a stent. Uh, we found that the flow reduction improvement uh, uh, changes with respect to the compaction level uh, follow uh, uh, in, in a following a linear uh, relationship, and for a given stent diameter, uh, we find a twenty five percent increase in the compaction ratio can lead to uh, a further improvement of ten percent uh, in in velocity, mass flow rate, and energy loss. And at a given compaction level, uh, treatment using different stent diameters. Uh, can have a maximal difference of 10% uh, in average velocity or energy loss or mass flow rate. This suggests um, to choose the appropriate size of the stand for the patient is important. Um, to model the dual stand implantation, we also uh, developed a strategy. We first deployed a stand uh, using the strategy we previously developed and we did a surface fitting of the deployed stand uh, forming um, this boundary constraint. Then uh, we deploy a second stand into, um, in, into, the, into the fitted, into the pseudovascular lumen and we assembled the two stands uh, into the aneurysm. So we got the uh, deployment result of the dual stand treatments. Um, uh, having those technologies, um, stand deployment, compaction, and uh, dual stand implantation, uh, we can individualize a flow division uh, plan based on virtual treatments and its subsequent uh, CFD simulation. Uh, this is an example. This is an unsuccessfully treated uh, aneurysm um, uh, using a, a, a silk stand. And as you can see, uh, six months past the treatments, there is still a um, there is still an aneurysm uh, residual here uh, displayed in the in the DSA. Um, compared to the uh, to the untreated condition, we designed uh, six possible treatment uh, uh, scenarios. The first two are a single stand deployment without any compaction applied during the deployment procedure. Uh, using uh, a standard four, four millimeter in diameter five. And scenarios three and four are uh, deployment of these two stands at maximal compaction. And scenario five and six uh, are dual stand deployment uh, with, um, with, with either five or four millimeter stands as the inner or outer layer stand. So, um, um, following the, the, the plan of treatments, we, we virtually uh, deployed stands um, into the patient aneurysm. Uh, as you can see, if we deploy a stand uh, with a smaller diameter uh, into uh, a stand with a larger diameter, there is, uh, there is clearly a gap between uh, the two layers of stands. And if we uh, compacting a stand uh, with a larger diameter um, during the deployment, then the stand wires might be pushed further into the aneurysm, and this may cause uh, treatment failure. And corresponding to each aneurysm, but uh, to each treatment scenario, we do uh, CFD simulation. We can see 
uh, the in the, the inflow pattern, the, the jet flow, uh, we can see the, um, the the flow mode inside the aneurysm, and uh, we compared um, the treatment, the virtual treatment. This is the virtual treatment using the four millimeter silk stand, which is uh, the same stand used in the real treatments. And CT and DSA uh, image suggest uh, the, the 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 residual aneurysm, uh, the shape and the flow angle and appearance of the inflow is in good agreement between our simulation and the clinical observation. So we hope that um, based on the technologies we developed, we can uh, provide um, this, this, um, this, this result to treating clinicians to help them to choose the optimal treatment plan um, for a patient. Like uh, we can see that if we deploy a stand with different diameter, how much difference uh, in the mass flow rate or energy could that occur? Or if we use a, a compaction technique, but apply to different, but apply to stand of different diameter, uh, what's the difference uh, could be? And if a dual stand treatment is used, uh, could the flow division efficacy can be improved? Uh, if this uh, quantification, this quantitative result can be provided uh, to, to the treating clinicians, they don't have to choose a treatment plan based on their experience. They have some, uh, uh, they have, they have some quantitative uh, statistics, statistics to rely on um, when they need to make a plan to, to, to treat the patient. And these are some other uh, applications related to uh, the stand study. Um, um, this is stand structure optimization strategy uh, the study. What, what we what we did is uh, we find the flow diverting stands uh, on the markets are all made from uh, homogeneous homogeneously distributed Y structure. Uh, but for uh, the the most important thing in 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 a flow diversion treatment needs to block the inflow. So we want to, we wanted to change the, we wanted to modify the, the, the wire distribution um, for each patient to achieve the, uh, the maximum flow diversion. And we use our exposement as the method um, to, to do CFD simulation. And we introduce um, random modification and we use a simulated annealing procedure to control the optimization process towards the global maximum. And we find that after um, stand optimization, the flow division efficacy can be improved uh, from 60, around 60% to, to more than uh, 90%. And uh, this is another study uh, uh, recommended by our uh, collaborating clinicians because in our aneurysm database we found some uh, stents um, are incompletely uh, expanded. We call it incomplete stent expansion. And for uh, for for coronary disease, uh, they call this phenomenon stent malaposition. Um, they they find uh, this phenomenon in in our uh, aneurysm database, but they don't know uh, whether incomplete stent expansion will cause, um, cause any change to the aneurysm uh, flow. So we modeled um, different severities of incomplete stent expansion at different segments uh, of, of the stents. And uh, we published this paper in, uh, in, 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 in the journal. And uh, this another study, uh, many groups, they propose different parameters in predicting uh, the treatment outcomes, but there is no consensus as to which parameter will, 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 will um, predict uh, the, um, a favorable flow diversion outcomes. And uh, we synthesized uh, uh, a lot of studies and we, 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 we use Fennel plot, we use Forest plot to see um, to see those, to see whether there is a, um, a a parameter that can be used by future studies uh, to predict the aneurysm um, stability, 
and uh, the stand deployment methodology uh, was also applied uh, to uh, to the deployment of another uh, uh, neurovascular device called Web. Um, the, um, this Web device was proposed to be put into the aneurysm sac instead of the perineal artery and is intended for the treatment, treatment of bifurcation aneurysms. And I designed, uh, I, I accommodated the, the stand deployment strategy to make it possible to be used for deployment of the web stand. So um, the current project uh, I'm doing with Susan's group is to predict the risk of cardiovascular diseases. Uh, the aim of our study was um, for, for uh, is for patients with without obstructive coronary diseases. We try to identify uh, those at a high risk uh, who might develop uh, atherosclerosis plaque in their coronary arteries. And for patients who already have coronary stenosis, uh, we try to identify those at a high risk uh, to develop cardiovascular events known as uh, MACE based on uh, the CCTA image-based CFD. We do a CFD simulation for, um, for their coronary artery to examine whether there are any hemodynamic parameter that can predict uh, the patient at high risk of developing disease or resulting in MACE. So what we did, we are retrospectively collected patients uh, CTCA image data and their clinical history and longitudinal follow-up results. And um, uh, we are currently uh, justifying a bunch of conditions uh, to be used to, um, to simulate uh, the, the coronary hemodynamics. And uh, um, the outlook, um, uh, Biofluid dynamics has is a very uh, promising field of research. Uh, by doing uh, CFD, we can contribute directly uh, to the care of patients to improve the, uh, the treatment quality. And there are many examples of uh, the uh, future application of, of, of biofluid simulation for the respiratory system um, we can we can we can simulate the airway resistance um, for, for an early diagnosis of COPD um, disease, and for the digestion system, we can uh, we can achieve non-invasive estimates estimation of the intrahepatic flow resistance um, for the early diagnosis of portal hypertension, and for patients with end-stage renal disease. Uh, we can use fluid dynamics to help design the atrial venous fistula um, to, to make the, the, the AVF uh, sustainable for their uh, hemodialysis. And we can also use CFD simulation uh, to help with um, novel medical device um, optimization design like intravascular uh, endoscopy. So finally, uh, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the support I received from uh, my supervisors and my collaborating partners back in the UN, SW, Makori, and Tokyo in Japan, BJOT in China. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'd like to answer any question if you may have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ningzi, for, for an excellent talk. Uh, we do have some time for questions now, so if you're in the audience and you'd like to ask a question, you can put your hand up or you can just unmute and go ahead and ask, or you can add it to the chat. That's that's fine too. So I think while, while people are gathering their thoughts a little bit, so I had a question about, I guess it's a pretty broad question and, and you might have touched on it, but what program are you actually doing your CFD simulation in? Is it in-house code? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, I use different safety programs for different uh, tasks. For uh, for for most of my simulations, I use ANSYS, CFX, or Fluence. But for the um, the flow diverter structure optimization, uh, I used a lattice Boltzmann method based 
uh, open library tables because we uh, we need to do simulation uh, for uh, for for more for for hundreds of times. We we have to automate the entire process. We don't we we can't manually uh, do the optimize uh, do do the CFD simulation. So I use different software for different tasks. Mostly I use CFX and Fluent, and I also use OpenFoam. Like across all the different CFD codes, that's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really, it's a nice way to do it, to specify what you need in the problem and then like find the CFD yeah. code. I also like to explore that. different software to compare their simulation inaccuracy or simulation efficiency. That's very, very well worth the effort. Um, all right, so anyone from the audience have a question? Do you have another question, which was, um, it's still thinking about the, the simulation themselves. And yeah. I guess my question came up, it was kind of came into the first part of the talk. I was yeah. wondering how much, like, what's the actual time to do these simulations, especially when I think, yes, the slide number eight, for instance, where you had to go in and actually like make a change to how the artery was set up. Like that looks like it would be quite time consuming for you to go in and do that change. Yeah, yeah. The part that consumes the most time is to segment the artery. We don't have a um, an algorithm to automatically segment the aneurysm uh, out of um, the, the the image mm -hmm. uh, for 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 three D RA three dimensional rotational angiography. Um, it's relatively easy because uh, DSA can subtract the bones and tissues and retain only uh, the vascular limbing field with contrast agents agent, uh, to segment those aneurysm below five minutes or 10 minutes, but for uh, but to segment aneurysm with perinatra from brain CTA is very complex. Um, a, uh, a PhD student um, was doing this uh, back in, in my lab at Macquarie and he can process at most two to three cases per day um, doing the manual uh, segmentation. So segmentation is uh, the procedure that costs the most time. Then meshing and CFD simulation, we can do that um, in, in parallel. We can do that um, by script. We, we used open form. Uh, we, we have developed a script to automatically realize the meshing and CFD simulation and post-processing to generate the energy loss or other parameters we need. So it's, we just do, do batch job for, for, for meshing and CFD. The, the procedure that costs most time is segmentation. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me as well. Um, oh, so we have a question in the chat. So I'm just going to read that out uh, just for the video. Yeah. So you had your in vitro experiment in your second project as a validation approach. And did you expect any differences or limitations between validating using a silicon model and real dynamic arteries with high plasticity and movement? Yes, I think this is a, a very good question. Um, the arterial wall in our simulation are always regarded as uh, uh, as rigid, uh, no elasticity or no deformation over a cardiac cycle. But uh, in reality, the, the vascular literature will uh, deform with respect to the change in, uh, in, in the pressure within the vascular literature. Uh, we, we think there might be uh, some difference between um, the virtual uh, between the, the in vitro model and uh, the in vivo model. But uh, um, I think the deformation could be uh, very limited in terms of the location of the aneurysm. It's inside the brain, it's not close to um, the, the, the heart or close to um, the, the location where pressure or change in velocities. Um, um, is very severe. So this is a good question. We, we, we try to do in vivo validation, but it's not possible. Um, 
as you know, stand, if, we deploy, if we deploy stand into, um, into the brand, you, you do a CTA, there are many artifacts. Um, you can't see um, exactly the, the, wires, the, the wire configuration of the, of the stand. Uh, by 3RA or Combing CT, you, you, can't, you can't observe, observe clearly. So the Oling, and thank you. Yeah, the, the only appropriate way for us to do the validation is to compare the stent structure in a um, and, and deployed in vivo, in vivo, not, not in vivo. Thank you for your question, QW. Yes, thank you for, for that question. Um, All right. Uh, any last questions coming in from the audience? Otherwise, we will thank our speaker once. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm going to pause because there is a question that's just come in. A couple of questions, actually. Sorry. You're happy to stay for a few more minutes, I'm sure. I'd love to get an answer. There's a couple more questions coming in on the chat. So yeah. I'll, I'll just read them out for the video. So the first one says, that's a very nice presentation. I have a couple <laughs> of you. questions. Uh, yeah. The first one is, in your simulations, whether there's a gap between the fluid domain and the flow diverter step, I'll let you ask that one first. Yes, yes, there is what we can see. Um, for um, within the segment of the aneurysm ostium, we can see that um, there's obviously a gap between um, the aneurysm and the flow diverting stand. But uh, at other portion of the perineal artery, there is no uh, gap between the stand and the aneurysm uh, and the perineal artery. Uh, because uh, our stand deployment method is uh, is just a geometrical deployment of the stands. It's not an FEA uh, process. Yeah, okay. and the second question is um, whether ahead, <laughs> flexible nature of vessel is constant. Uh, no, I think this question is similar to the question raised by QW. We didn't consider the flexibility or the deformation of the vascular chart. Um, in our simulation, the simulation we mostly performed our steady state simulation, and uh, we consider the vascular wall to be rigid, so uh, it's not flexible. Thank you for your question, uh, Chani Kia. And, um, Yes, we have another. Yeah, next question. Then you turn on the floor. Uh, for uh, most simulation, yeah. For most uh, simulation, yeah. I was just going to read it out. Sorry for the recording. <laughs> <laughs> so, ask, um, yeah. So, the first quite part of the question was Have you considered the shear thinning nature of the blood or assumed the fluid as Newtonian? Yeah, we assumed the blood to be uh, Newtonian um, fluid um, following uh, studies in, in the literature, but we do you have a plan to consider um, the, 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 thing, the shear thinning nature of the blood in our simulation for the coronary artery diseases? For most uh, um, simulation for cerebral aneurysm, they just adopt um, the Newtonian model for, for the blood to, to make uh, our result comparable to those already published. Uh, we just follow their simulation settings. But for uh, my current project, the, the coronary risk, we're using uh, the non Newtonian uh, blood flow assumption. Thank you for your question, Jijo. All right. Thank you for those questions coming through in the chat. Um, any, any other last question? Give it a little moment. Couple of things thank coming you. through. I think that looks like it might be the end of the question. So thank you very much again for your excellent talk, Lindsay. Um, thank you, Kat. Thank you, everyone. All right. We'll stop recording now.